I'm going to start off uh, in this session with uh, a couple of slides, um, just a, a few uh, short slides to kind of explain some things. Um, and then we're going to jump into uh, Rhino and we're going to illustrate uh, how these concepts actually work. Um, and so what we're talking about um, is basically, uh, I want to just kind of step back uh, for a little bit and think broadly about uh, 3D design software. So um, you may or may not be aware of this, but there are probably um, several dozen uh, 3D software packages um, that are out on the market, um, and they're all sort of geared towards different specializations and different um, uh, kind of things that you may do with 3D software. Um, so uh, just for a quick example, um, you have uh, packages like Maya or 3D Studio Max that are really geared towards the cinematic effects market. Um, and then, of course, you also have packages like AutoCAD that are very much geared towards the engineering and product innovation uh, kind of market. And so Rhino, I think um, the one of the reasons why we use Rhino in the art department is because it sits somewhere in, in the middle. Um, so if we take a look at, um, uh, from a technological perspective, there are different uh, sort of uh, categories of doing stuff in 3D on the computer. Um, and most of those categories have to do with literally what kind of math or um, how shapes and points uh, are being defined. So uh, one thing that we will are doing in Rhino, you can't use Rhino without using NURBS um, because Rhino is fundamentally a NURBS modeler. Um, you may look at other uh, 3D modelers that are, are also NURBS modelers. So Blender, um, Maya, some of those other packages also have the capability to work in NURBS. Um, and what NURBS means, it's a total NERD acronym called Non-Uniform Rational Beast Lines. You don't need to know that. Um, but uh, it's basically uh, the idea of NURBS are that their curves, um, they can be straight lines, but they work, they excel at curved shapes um, and so-called freeform surfaces. And um, they're sort of infinitely scalable. Um, so they retain that sort of curvature um, into, uh, you know, um, the, very close to the end application of something actually being made. And so uh, the whole idea of NURBS um, actually comes, uh, for the history nerd out there, um, the, uh, the history of NURBS is actually in shipbuilding. Um, and so when they would, when they would build the curved um, surfaces of, uh, of, a, of a ship, um, they had to think about a uh, complex uh, curve geometry and they actually made the wood bend by using uh, lead weights that would hook onto the wood and pull it um, to different points. So, so basically what we're using right now is actually used to be a, a, a physical system. Um, for mathematically controlling curves. And when you, every time you use a control point, um, you might want to reflect on the fact that that control point, even though in uh, Rhino it's sort of mythically hanging out there, um, that back in ye olden days, it used to be uh, an actual physical thing that was pulling on a piece of material. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then, of course, there's polygonal modeling. So when you're playing a game, uh, pretty much any game that has a 3D component, um, I'm not going to shout any of them out because it's been a while since I've, uh, I think, gosh, well, don't, hmm, what is the last game I played? Probably Elder Scrolls. Uh, I'm an Elder Scrolls fan. But anyway, um, any of that graphics in that real-time environment where, you know, things are happening and, you're, uh, you know, getting your party together to go out on a raid, uh, that I can absolutely guarantee you is a 
polygonal model. Um, and the reason why I'm I'm sort of making the <laughs> making the blanket uh, statement that all uh, games use polygonal geometry is because it's really fast. Um, and uh, I would love to, if you can find an example of a game that works in NURBS, I would be stunned and I would also be amazed. Um, and I might even make that an impromptu extra credit challenge. <laughs> um, uh, I will give you a point on your final grade <laughs> if you can find a, a 3D game that does not use uh, polygons. So uh, another type of uh, modeling sort of, you know, tool is the idea of surface, surface subdivision. And so surface subdivision is basically when you take a, when you take a, ooh, sparkle, um, when you take a, a faceless uh, rectangular cube, and you make it rounder and sleeker um, by creating creating interstices interstitial spaces um, around that. Um, and so we can find uh, certainly some some uh, examples of surface subdivision modeling tools. Um, but now, one thing you may notice, and you'll definitely notice this in Rhino is that a lot of the, uh, in fact, all of these tools that I'm describing uh, right now, um, they used to be se separate software packages, and now most software packages have one or more of these things uh, in them. Because, uh, you know, it's a trend of software to kind of try to be all things to all people. Um, you can see this in Photoshop, uh, the way Photoshop has kind of blended and morphed over the last 20 years. Um, so, so when you're looking for, I think the, the three most important kind of differentiations are this, uh, are the idea of using NURBS, which are freeform curves, uh, polygons, which are wicked fast, um, and hand up really well to textures. Uh, and then also the last category is constructive solid geometry. And, um, that really forms the foundation of what we know now as AutoCAD. Um, so if you have ever met anyone from the engineering department who uses SOLIDWORKS and is just like, why would you ever use anything but SOLIDWORKS? <laughs> um, uh, SOLIDWORKS, AutoCAD, OpenSCAD, these uh, packages all are sort of built under that in underlying in, um, architecture of uh, constructive solid geometry, which uh, is really kind of like a symbolic uh, language uh, of dealing with shape. Um, and so it is really good um, when you're combining shapes with other shapes. So one of the things that really... Uh, AutoCAD is really great great at is if you're building a machine in AutoCAD um, and you have little machine screws that are all over it that kind of hold it together. In in AutoCAD, you can just say, hey, screws, um, you need to be longer. Make all the screws longer. And um, AutoCAD will just do it to all the screws. Um, and that's something that in a traditional 3D modeler would take forever. So, um, so it certainly has its advantages. Um, you know, it also has some disadvantages, like it doesn't make, uh, you know, freeform curves very well. So anyway, these are just uh, terms that if you're thinking about using software in the future, um, you may want to just, you know, be familiar with. And so if we think just for a second about this idea of non-uniform rational beast lines, it sounds really kind of like scary and, you know, advanced. Um, it's totally not. Um, this is a really uh, sort of primitive example of uh, a, a NURB. And uh, if anyone in the class has used uh, Adobe Illustrator before, um, it's exactly the same. Uh, just in three dimensions. <laughs> um, so you can see these uh, control points. We'll be working with control point curves at, at length in this class. Um, and so uh, working with control point curves is one of the things that Rhino is really good at. And um, it's one of the things that Rhino really, uh, you know, if you're using Rhino, it's one of the benefits that you can get um, by you making shapes like that. So we are, um, again, you know, going to be editing control points. Um, 
the when we do get to make control points, um, which I think we can spend some time on that today even, just to kind of get started, um, there is this notion of, a lot of students ask me all the time, how many control points do I need? Um, and the answer is not really super easy. Um, I mean, it's, as you can see in the slide behind us, um, you know, this model has like two control points and it's looking pretty good, right? Um, so, so certainly like, you know, having a, a, a line that has like thousands of control points um, is going to be a, a burden on performance. Um, and so it is definitely something to think about. Um, and then if just for sort of visualization purposes, if we want to get these control points into three dimensions, um, we can also in Rhino do what's called soft editing, um, which is where you basically take a, a surface and you start to kind of move those points around. Um, that's just another method of uh, working in Rhino. And so we'll, we'll start to, uh, as we move on in the next uh, week or two, we'll start to see some things that, that look like this. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump back into Rhino. And um, I did promise that we would illustrate um, some of these concepts about what are NURBS and what are polygons? Why does it matter? Why should I care? We're going to actually look at it um, in Rhino. So if I want to start, I'm going to start by making a NURBS object because uh, in Rhino, the, the, uh, um, the tendency is that Rhino is fundamentally a, a NURBS modeler. So in general, when you're working in Rhino, you're starting with NURBS and you're converting to polygons. Um, you can now make things in polygons with Rhino, but it's kind of crappy, um, and I wouldn't bother. I would go find a polygon modeler. So now, let's go ahead and do something semi semi meaningful here. So we had had this um, example of the water bottle, and I think what I'm going to do, I think I'm just going to make this water bottle as sort of an exercise. And I'm going to go ahead and take this top part off, just um, this little, you know, this clampy bit, um, because uh, I don't think we're going to have time to get through that. So, so as I said, I think this would be a really great example of like how to model something by breaking it into simple shapes. And so if I look at so, kind of study some of the main details of this water bottle, um, I certainly don't have to like measure it, um, although that'll help me get a more accurate sort of uh, proportioned copy. Um, but I also, I, you know, I've pointed out there's a kind of cylindrical part here. There's like a shoulder here and then there's a cone. Um, and then there's a sort of like, you know, poofy cylinder here, the cylinder that kind of bulges out. So, so if I wanted to start with this, I would certainly feel like a good place to start would be the cylinder. I also think that, oh my god, what are the odds that I actually found a tape measure in my own home? <laughs> so um, let's see. Okay, so it's 12 inches high and it's about three and a half uh, inches in diameter. So just to kind of give myself some guide rails, I'm not going to measure like you know, each little part of it ob obsessively. But I think just to um, give me some guide rails on this, I'm going to go ahead and make a rectangular rectangular box. Um, and I'm going to make that just using corner to corner. Um, it's three and a half. So you can see I just can use the grid right away. It's like, that's my three and a half. And then I want to take it up to uh, about 12 inches. So I can see on that bottom part now, I'm at three and a half and 12. So I'd show you with the cursor, but I don't want to uh, mess this up. So then I just click. And so now I have what 
what basically is going to amount to like a bounding box for this thing. And that's just going to help me kind of visually proportion against, you know, what uh, what's going on here. So, I mean, I guess since I have a measuring tape, I could measure one more thing, which I kind of want to know. Um, so the other thing that I want to know is I kind of want to know how far up does the cylindrical part go. And so it looks like it goes up to about six inches. Okay, so um, so then I also have that kind of six inch thing happening. So let's see. One thing that I think would be nice for this bounding box is if I sh sort of shove it over a quarter inch. And the reason I would do that is that then I can use the grid to center things. So let me do that. So I want to move this kind of precisely. As I said, I want to shove it over a quarter inch. So if I kind of click and drag, I'm not going to get the level of precision that I need. Um, I can actually use the move tool. Uh, so with the move tool, it's right here. You can type move into this command thing. Uh, most commands, so I just click and, and then click where I want it to be. And so now uh, this grid line is the, the sort of center, which is kind of nice. And so I'm just going to put a line, uh, and again, this is really a guideline. Um, Um, and I'm going to pop that up about six inches. And so this uh, little line right here is actually going to become the kind of central axis of this bottle form, which, um, as you noticed, probably about the bottle form, it's it's round in in one in one dimension. So we basically need uh, to have like an imaginary line that runs through the center of the bottle. And then we're going to make a shape and we're going to just rotate it around that. So now we've kind of set this up. Um, you know, you could probably do this without doing this, but um, I think that this just gives a little extra, a little extra help. So we could go ahead and just make a straight up cylinder um, for that that part that looks completely cylind cylindrical. Um, so I I do note want to make note of the fact that there's this sort of radius on the bottom. So technically the the cylinder, the actual cylinder part would start like maybe like about a quarter inch or three eighths of an inch up. So. Um, So I'll do just a quarter of an inch because that seems reasonable. And then the radius um, is going to be... Now notice that I wanted to specify the radius in the front viewport, right? Um, because I don't want to have it be like that. That's, you know, turned 90 degrees. So this is one of the reasons why it's good to have the four viewports out so you can kind of see what's happening. Um, and then I just want to take this up to the top done. And um, once again, I feel like um, this would probably be a great time to start using some sort of shaded viewport over here so I can see how things are working. Um, now, I don't actually, when you make a cylinder, it makes, uh, it makes um, you know, a solid. So I actually don't need it to be a solid. So what I can do is um, I can use the explode command, which is right here. And after I explode it, I can just delete the top and the bottom. Um, so uh, and then if I joined it back together, I could use the join command to kind of weld it back together. Um, and so this looks great. So I'm going to uh, come in here and try to kind of cap off the bottom. Um, so let's go ahead and I think I'm going to start here and 
Um, I am making a control point curve at this point. So, uh, um, so I'm just going to do that. So control point curves can be kind of tricky. Um, but uh, the idea is that the points are sort of sitting outside of the curve. Um, and the other thing about control point curves that I tell people, um, if you're making a control point curve for the first time or you're not used to doing control point curves, you can totally just go ahead and get the start point and the end point where you want to be, and then you can come back in here and you can move these around, like, until you're, you know, really tired of doing that. So now what I want to do is I want to make this bottom surface by spinning this uh, curve around this axis. And so I can do that by using the revolve command. So that's called the surface revolve. And uh, it asks me for the start of the axis and the end of the axis. Um, and you can see now I'm kind of on that, you know, 90 degree thing. Um, and then it'll ask for a start angle, but we actually can also just click this button to push it full circle. And you can see now we've got our like slightly depressed and rounded over bottom. Okay, so um, just a couple more things here. Um, so we've got... Um, this sort of large kind of like swoopy bit here um, and then we've got a sort of p pinch here and then this kind of um, upper uh, bottle part. So I'm going to make a control point curve and um, I think I'm basically just going to eyeball it. I will admit I have plenty of plenty of uh, experience with the control point curves. So um, I actually want the curve to go like this way, right? So if I were to start, I'm going to start here. And if I want the curve to go this way, a lot of people's impulse would be to click there. But no, no, no. <laughs> we're going to click over here. And then we're going to kind of put this um, there and then open it up a little bit. And so now instead of freaking out and saying, oh my god, it's not exactly the way I want it to be, uh, definitely don't do that. Don't freak out. You can just come back in here and, you know, move it around. So this, I think we want to move a good bit. That's starting to look a little more plausible. Um, and then I want to make a separate control point curve for this little this little bit right here. Um, could I make like a hard corner for the and just keep going? I mean, yeah, I guess I could, but it's probably easier to just make a separate one. So uh, again, I want to kind of be outside of where I want the curve and then push the curve in. Um, I can see already it's so not to scale. So, um, so I can take these uh, these two points and actually to drag it down like that, and then I can also drag this down to kind of meet that point. Now you may notice that I have my snaps enabled. Um, I have Smart Track, and I also am using the end point snap right now, which is super useful for me. Um, so because we're working with a lot of curves right now, it just makes sense because, you know, the end of the line is where I usually want the curve to meet other curves. Um, so when I, uh, when I click on this, um, it will give me the option of snapping to the end of that. So rather than snapping to the grid, we're actually snapping to the stuff that's on the screen. Um, so just to quickly demonstrate. If you make a polyline, you can see here it's snapping to the end point of this, to the end point of this, to the end point of this. Um, and there are all sorts of other parameters that you can select, but this is the one that is good for right now. Okay, so let's, um, we don't want to spend too much time doing this, 
So I'm going to take this, uh, these two shapes and I'm going to uh, go ahead and do that revolve uh, method again to get a surface. So the start of the revolve axis would be, um, I could use the same curve that I have in here and put it in a full circle. All right. So it's not perfect, but it's close enough, I think. Um, hello. It's springtime. So let's see. Um, now, I would say this is pretty, pretty decent. Um, I think it's going to be a great illustration of, of the difference between NURBS and uh, polygons. So um, what I'm going to do, these are actually all still separate surfaces. So I'm going to select all these little surfaces by hitting the shift key and I'm going to join them. And you can see here it says four surfaces joined into three open poly surfaces. So it's not, it's not joining them um, probably because they're not like uh, super perfect. So uh, what we can also do in this case is just group them. Um, and by grouping them, it's just going to give me a chance to kind of save when I duplicate it and move it over. Um, it's going to give me a chance to kind of um, not have to click on all the little pieces. Okay, so there is one and two and three. And we're going to take a couple of these and we're going to convert them to polygons. So um, let's see. So you can see when they're in NURBS format that they are really like um, smooth and you can sort of um, zoom on, on that curvature endless, endlessly, in fact. Um, there is really no uh, no limit there. Um, so so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, one of these bottles and I'm going to convert it to a polygon mesh. And um, when incidentally this process that I'm doing right now of converting it to a polygon mesh it's exactly the same as when you convert it um, for 3d printing um, so I'm going to convert it to a fairly low res polygon mesh so it will become painfully obvious um, what uh, is happening with it Now, we do have to actually delete the NURBS object that's back here. Um, and so now we can sort of see what's going on there. Um, we'll be able to see it even more clearly. I'm going to make a high resolution polygon mesh here. Um, and the high resolution polygon mesh yeah, is going to be uh, much, much better in appearance. Um, let me get rid of that NURBS object. Okay, so now we're looking at the sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, lines uh, of the surfaces. And so this would be a good opportunity to maybe, uh, you know, go to something like a rendered viewport temporarily. Um, just to get rid of that uh, that effect, and you can see that um, that you can definitely see on that middle bottle that's the low polygon one that it has some some problems. Um, and basically, what you're doing is you're trying to you know. Um, You're trying to, uh, you know, convert something that's a perfect, mathematically perfect circle, circular curve into something that uh, has facets. Um, and you can see really clearly, like, how those facets, you know, are displayed. 
Now on the high resolution one, you don't see uh, nearly as much faceting, right, if any at all. Um, the problem with the high resolution polygon mesh is that you're, if you're trying to operate in a game environment, um, a high resolution polygon mesh is not feasible for rendering in real time. So, um, so it's a it's a it's an issue. I mean, you know, of course, uh, things are getting faster and faster, but um, uh, po high resolution polygon meshes are can really be like a lot of file size. Um, I had a student once who wanted to model a, a car, uh, and it was like something like three gigabytes for this model, and it was of course had like you know tenths. Uh, 10,000 seven inch tolerance or something and it's just not it's just not practical you know to work at that level of resolution for most people um, and it's certainly not practical for for gaming consoles <laughs> so um, so if you're making something for a print I would certainly opt for the high resolution uh, polygon mesh because with the high, high resolution polygon mesh, it's not um, processing it uh, in a time you know, sensitive environment. If it takes a couple seconds to process the file, it doesn't really matter if the 3D print is gonna take you know, 10, 10 hours or something. Um, so, so I would certainly use a higher resolution uh, polygon mesh for a 3D print. Um, if you're looking at using any kind of real-time rendering, you really do want to uh, look at a low poly uh, model. Um, and then typically a lot of the quality that people see are, is not in the geometry, it's actually in the texturing. Um, I'm putting really wonderful uh, textures and uh, having really w wonderful rendering environments. So. Uh, that's about that on the high versus low poly, uh, thing. Um, let's take, uh, like a quick shift here. And, uh, we've done this, uh, water bottle. So let's sort of think, um, maybe a little more abstractly about ways to make surfaces. So, um, we had a chance to see this revolve command, which is super useful. Um, people like really like it, really like using it. Um, we also have, uh, lots of other ways of making sur simple surfaces. So, um, we're going to not, uh, sort of go jump ahead to making solids. We're going to come up with some interesting ways of making surfaces first. So uh, probably next week we'll start thinking about solids and we'll start thinking about um, really, uh, you know, using, um, using all of these methods together to kind of create solid shapes. So if we make a control point curve, um, and again, you know, this is going to be like a really kind of weird, weird for uh, the people that don't use the control point curve. So if I want my curve to go here, I'm going to want my point to go there. So just to kind of like get people used to this idea, maybe you can sort of see now the relationship of the, of the control point to the curve. And let's see. I'm basically just making a blob. It's one of my favorite shapes. There we go. Nice little worm blob. Um, and now we know a couple of things about this closed shape. Number one, it's closed. Um, we made sure to do that right here. Um, number two, it's definitely planar. So probably the most direct way to make a surface out of this would be to use planar curves. Um, and, you know, we did that, I think, in the previous video. Um, let me get this view mode changed really quickly. Let's see. Ah. Active viewport. Okay, so, so we know we can make a planar, uh, just a flat surface by selecting planar curves. 
Okay, no problem. Done. Easy. Um, let's try a couple of other methods and let's just kind of experiment and play with some of these other surface methods. So uh, one thing that we can do is we can extrude the curve um, straight. Uh, we can go straight to making a solid by doing extrude planar curve straight. Um, a long curve is another option to a point and tapered. So um, we can certainly do it uh, straight. So let's move this straight. That makes a solid on there. Um, and uh, another one of my favorite extrusion methods is to do it through a curve. So if I take a curve in the other sort of dimension um, and I'm just going to make a very simple curve, but notice that it's perpendicular to the um, to this uh, object um, or the planar curve rather. So then I can come in here to solid extrude planar curve, a long curve. So it says select path curve near start. And we can do that. And then it's some stuff is starting to happen. Um, so that's a super fun way to get uh, relatively complex uh, shapes. And of course, um, you know, the other sort of thing to maybe think about with stuff like this is, well, what would happen if we mirrored it or if we, you know, flipped it or um, thought about transforming it. And so if I wanted to transform it, we'll go over some basic transformation tools too before we hang up for the day. Um, if I wanted to go ahead and transform this, uh, I want to probably work in the front view. Um, let's say that I wanted to copy this and then uh, rotate it so that it goes out the bottom. So um, I could use the uh, rotate tool. So the rotate tool is um, right here. And rotation can really throw people off in Rhino for some reason. Um, so we're just going to click on it. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is you want to set up a center of rotation, okay? So I'm going to make that right there. And then you define the first reference point, which what it's asking you for is it's, it's basically asking you to tell me what is flat. Um, and so in this case, this horizontal line is our kind of first reference. And then the second reference is where you actually transform the shape. And of course, it's a good idea when you're doing that. Let's do it again. Um, if you click the copy button here, um, then you can get um, a sort of uh, clean copy. Um, and so now you can see we have our copy down there. Um, so, yeah, it's um, thinking about um, surface creation methods, um, if we were to sort of like move this over and just start another, another method. Um, another great method is this, um, it, and it does not have to be coplanar. Um, if I make another control point curve right here, and um, I'm going to start uh, so that it's kind of on the end point there. So, so it's kind of hard actually not to make something that's coplanar in Rhino if you've got the right um, mode enabled and so right now I'm actually I have my snaps enabled so it's um, in order to make this not uh, coplanar I'm just going to need to take this point right here and push it off axis um, oops. 
Hang on just a second. I'm just going to move this stuff out of the way for now. And that's much better. So... So I was just um, having to click this single point. And so now you can see it's kind of bent off of the of that plane there. Um, but I do want the first two uh, points to you know match up. Okay, so so here's a scenario where we have uh, two curves that are not coplanar. So you can see they're not on the same plane. Um, one has been kind of tweaked. Um, or you could just create them in separate planes. So what we could do with this, there's an, a surface creation method that's kind of neat called edge curves. Um, so we're going to select both of them and come into the surface menu and go for edge curves. And you can see what you get when you select edge curves is a non-planar surface. Um, so if you're making something like leaves or petals or, you know, that kind of thing, this is perfect. Um, and you can really do a lot with, uh, with this whole um, idea. So I think that is going to wrap it up for today. Um, I want to kind of get started on a kind of project-oriented um, thing that's a, a little bit more kind of complex and step-by-step. Um, so let's look forward to that uh, this coming week, and uh, hopefully everyone can get outside a little bit. Ah. Bye, y'all.